Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. The other night, we did the meditation before the talk. I think tonight we might give the talk before the meditation. See how that goes. Yesterday, I had the good fortune to attend His Holiness the Dalai Lama's commentary on the Heart Sutra in a big Vietnamese temple in Brayburn. So today I've been spending a little bit of time recollecting some of the things that he said and I thought I might share some of what he said with you as far as my memory remembers anyway and then uh, draw some parallels between the Theravada that we practice because there are uh, very many parallels that was what was uh, wonderful to observe. So for myself, in terms of listening to Dhamma, I trained with Ajahn Jaya Saro and Ajahn Pasano in my early years. Later, when I understood more Thai, I spent time and listened to a lot of teachings by Tan Ajahn and Nan. All of these monks were disciples of Ajahn Chah. Also spent some time with Ajahn Samedo, so listen to a lot of good Dhamma in English, but in the monastery where I'm an abbot in Thailand, mostly we listen to, uh, I put on CDs of Ajahn Nun, and we listen to the teachings in Thai mostly. So for me, it's very nice, uh, being a monk for 17 years, very nice to go and listen to His Holiness every now and then, because contemplating the same Dhamma, but hearing it from a slightly different angle, and uh, it's good for Dhamma Vichaya. Dhamma Vichaya is this faculty that we have for investigating Dhamma. It's one of the seven factors of enlightenment. So it's very good to be contemplating Dhamma. So yesterday His Holiness was talking about the Heart Sutra, which the Mahayana tells us was taught on Vulture's Peak Mountain by a Bodhisattva called Avalokiteshvara. And it was taught to what, it's, what that sutta says, a great assembly of beings. Now, I've been to Vultures Peak a few times, and I've meditated there, and it's a lovely place to meditate. But it's a very small area on top of that mountain. So I had wondered, where did that great assembly of beings assemble? Now, His Holiness said yesterday, and this is interesting, because I've never heard him say it this Frankly, he said that teaching was taught to he called deities. So in the Theravada we would call them Devata, Tevada in Thai, radiant beings. So a lot of people doubt this, it's not in the Pali Canon, so a lot of uh, Theravadans doubt the Mahayana Suttas. And I'm not going to try to convince anyone that the Mahayana Suttas are real, but our own texts do tell us that the Buddha did teach the Devas for one watch of every evening for 45 years of his life. So certainly there are occasions where the Buddha was teaching the Devas. One example is in uh, Jetavana, a radiant Deva appeared and filled the whole monastery with her radiance and asked Lord Buddha what gives rise to the most auspicious conditions, what gives rise to the most highest blessings, and the Lord Buddha taught 38 practices which give rise to the greatest blessing called the Mangala Sutta. So we have uh, examples like this where the Buddha gives teachings to Devas, possibly others not recorded. But uh, the Mahayana and the Vajrayana tend to have more symbolic, they, have, they use symbolism a little more than our suttas. Our suttas uh, tend to be very practical instructions, sensible analogies, parables, metaphors that the Buddha himself explained. But in the Mahayana and the Vajrayana you get more symbolic meanings. And so there was a mantra taught in that sutta. It's the end of the sutta. It's called the, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom. And the mantra goes, Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhisoha. And what His Holiness said it means is uh, basically go, go further, go even further into Bodhi. 
Bodhi meaning Bodhi Jnana, the wisdom, insight, knowing things according to truth. So then he said, how do we practice that according to the Pali tradition? So we actually talked about how we go about practicing that and spoke directly, basically, exactly how my own teachers teach us that there are three ways to cultivate wisdom. But before we talk about wisdom, on a foundation of sila, His Holiness said this very beautifully, and it was exactly what Ajahn Chah would say, as far as I could tell. On a foundation of sila, keeping your five precepts, or your monk or nun's precepts, if you're a monastic, one maintains consistent mindfulness. So that's knowing one's thoughts, knowing one's posture, keeping the mind clear and wholesome. Then with that foundation of good ethics and consistent mindfulness, it's possible to practice one-pointedness. Basically, some samadhi arises. With that samadhi, the mindfulness is strengthened. And then through one's investigations, the wisdom is sharper and insight occurs, which uproots delusions and destroys ignorance. So that was a very succinct and accurate, as far as I can tell, description about how we, how we practice. Then in terms of developing wisdom, there are three ways or three levels. One is through listening to teachings. So, or that can be reading as well, studying the suttas, reading uh, commentaries, listening to Dhamma talks. This is one way that we develop wisdom. We hear these concepts that point to the truth and we, we begin to contemplate them. The next level is deeply investigating and, and contemplating that analytically. In Pali we would say Yoniso Mani Sakara, wise reflection, reflective meditations. Then there's another level of wisdom that we experience through practicing in-depth meditation a great deal. So that's the wisdom that comes from meditation on a deeper level. So uh, that's what he was saying, this mantra, gate, go, paragate, go further, parasangate, go even further, into bodhi. It's the three types of wisdom that lead one into knowing the ultimate truth. So that was nice, that was relevant. He pointed to the, probably the most important line in the Sutta is this line, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness. And this is actually a very profound statement and it can be easily misunderstood or ridiculed even but His Holiness was explaining what it means. And this is pointing once again to ultimate truth. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness. And so he gave the example, he was asking what does that mean, he gave the example of an elephant. Now in this day and age an elephant probably isn't the best example because for us elephant is something exotic, something in a circus or a zoo, uh, or something that you go to Thailand to see or ride on. But in ancient India, an elephant was a symbol of power. It was something that the king had, it was something that the army had, it was something that got uh, decorated at weddings and, and uh, taken out on special occasions. So the elephant was central to uh, Indians as a, a symbol of power. But to us it's, uh, it seems a little strange. But anyway, he was saying, suppose you have a forest, and this, and this analogy also exists in our suttas. Suppose you're, you want to cultivate an awareness of emptiness and you're in a forest grove and there no, are no elephants. That's the other thing, is in the old days there were lots of elephants in the jungle, which is where the monks and nuns were practicing. So you contemplate the absence of the elephant in that jungle grove. Just to get a sense of uh, the way perceptions work and to become a little more aware of space. Now, all of us in our habits tend to fixate on things and tend to react. So we're very fixated on, on objects. So that means the people that you like and the people that you don't like. And the people that you like, you tend to really like them. And the people that you don't like, you tend to really not like them. And then there's the food that we like and the food we don't like and the sounds we like and the sounds we don't like. And for most people, 
unless they begin to train their minds, basically you'll be stuck with that experience for a long, long time. We just deepen our habits of liking and not liking and reacting endlessly, and it's very exhausting actually. But uh, in meditation training, we contemplate the way we perceive things and meditate and reflect. And so this example of you're in a jungle and you meditate upon the absence of the elephant, what it points to is an awareness of empty space. And Arjun Sumedho talks about this a lot, especially in his retreats that he used to teach the monastics, because in monastic life, so we have to associate with people that we wouldn't choose to associate with and we can't avoid them and, and uh, it's good. It's grist for the mill for practice that you get to practice with uh, irritating people that you might have to sit in the line right next to the monk that you like least that if he was the monk that ordained one year before you and that might be every day that you're in the monastery and it's very good because you get to see uh, here he comes and you get to see the the feeling and you get to see the, the thoughts and you can see the reaction and you get to train within this container you know exactly what time you're going to see this person <laughs> and you get to train but so he was saying it's really helpful and really important to bring awareness to the space around the person so if you're sitting in the hall and there are two rows in front of you or two rows behind you as I like, look at the space around them and investigate okay the reaction occurs when you look at them and you perceive them and then you react. But if you look at the space and you place your awareness and your attention on the space, you don't have the reaction. And so we train ourselves in a, as a discipline to be aware of space and place attention at space. And this is very helpful and important in meditation practice. We do the same thing with our irritating thoughts and our uh, obsessive thoughts and compulsions. What you do is when you notice the thought, you just get determined to watch it until it ceases. And then when it ceases, notice the space after the thought ceases. Because our thoughts are very intoxicating, they're very deluding, we believe them, they take us for a ride. And so in meditation practice, as you do more and more, when you're having that thought, those thought complexes, those proliferations that are unpleasant that you're basically fed up with but you can't quite stop. You just set the intention, I'm going to be with this until it ceases and I know it's going to cease and when it ceases I'm going to notice that cessation and then I'm going to allow myself to be aware of the space that occurs after something ceases. Awareness of space and awareness of cessation, awareness of the absence of things is an important part of our meditation practice. It's part of that contemplation of Dhamma, which gives rise to wisdom and weakens delusion. And when we meditate more deeply, it's part of that third type of wisdom when we experience directly for ourselves the absence of suffering uh, due to letting go of the causes of suffering. So that was one way, but this wasn't what that statement His Holiness was saying. This is not what the statement, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness. That's not what it's pointing to. He also said this uh, other thing that you could say is, there is no elephant. You could say that as a statement, even if the elephant was there, as a kind of a denial, or I think he used the word abnegation. But he says that's irrational and illogical because you can't say, as soon as you say there is no elephant, you're already acknowledging the elephant in saying that it doesn't exist. So that's not, and they use this funny word, that's not tenable. So that's not a tenable statement. Then what are you saying this statement means? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is not other than emptiness, is there is no independently existing, solid, unchanging elephant. So this is where we get to Buddhist, the real Buddhist contemplations. Paticca Samapada, dependent, co-arising. So what the elephant is, is a combination of many things that have supported that form for a period of time. But there's nothing in the elephant. If you investigate the trunk, or the tusks, or the eyes, the ears, the tail, the skin, there's no one part of it that you can point to and say it's the elephant, separately existing, independent, solid elephant. It's when all of those things come together in that particular shape. We call it conventionally an elephant. 
essentially what he was pointing to is the same thing that Lord Buddha points to, is that the elephant is made of the four elements and has consciousness. And uh, the consciousness was born into the form of an elephant according to its karma. But basically the elephant is always changing. So it was a, a baby elephant, an adolescent elephant, an adult elephant. And if it lives a long life, it grows old and then it dies. But there's nothing solid about the elephant at all, even though it's a very big, that's the other thing about the example of elephants, is they're very big, aren't they? They're a very compelling and convincing phenomena. I mean, if there's an elephant in the room, you notice it. But what the sutta is pointing to is the fact that its nature is in constant flux, and even though it's appearing, there's nothing about it which is solid. And there's nothing about it that can stay still, even for a second. So, and what he was explaining that is when people train in understanding this, if you use your analytical skills, contemplation and meditation, you can come to the point where you see forms and as you see them, you know them to be empty in nature. And he says this isn't about being intellectually sophisticated or clever and trying to show off. He said it's the direct antidote to the delusion that we all experience of grasping at things as being solid and real. And he says, so all of this reactivity that we have around that particular being that we perceive as being solidly that person who we don't like, our enemy, our mother-in-law, our ex-husband, or whoever it is, there's a very solid perception in the mind, that person who causes me so much suffering. <laughs> And then, basically, this is the antidote, it's the remedy, it's the method which weakens the grasping, so that when you see that person, if you could understand there's no solidly inherently existing mother-in-law, she is ultimately empty. Even now, while she's sitting there, she's empty. And uh, if you understand that if you really train in this, in a meditative discipline, that you can experience that, that even when you see the forms, you know them to be empty, and when you know them to be empty, you don't react to them. So that's what it really points to, is the capacity to, to be non-reactive, to be equanimous, to, be, to maintain equilibrium, to be serene, to be peaceful. And the Buddha says, peacefulness is the highest happiness, the absence of suffering. So it's very nice to listen to His Holiness uh, talk about those things. And uh, I was thinking probably a more relevant example these days is you could say there's no inherently existing Lexus or Benz or Bima. That might be for us an example of something that we're very interested in. Lots of people want it. Just thinking if there was anything else. Oh yes. So he was saying the way that he employs this analytical meditation to see the inherently empty nature of beings is to train in having an impartial loving-kindness that is equal for all beings. So when we recognize that we like some beings, some people, and we don't like other people, when you set the intention to have loving-kindness and compassion for all of them, the more insight that you can develop about the fact that they're not a solidly existing in the way that they appear and that their nature is empty, or in Theravada we would say not self, they are not self, impermanent, then the obstruction of perceiving people as enemies or even having people that one likes or dislikes or feels neutral towards can be uh, completely pacified so that you just see all beings as being deserving of loving kindness and compassion and as soon as you see one if you've trained in the Brahma Viharas we call them if you've trained in loving kindness compassion mudita as soon as you see a being you respond with thoughts of loving kindness that's the other advantage of training uh, the mind to see beings as not being solid so we can see that uh, these methods, these trainings, very profound and have a lot of benefits. And you see that uh, they go hand in hand. So in Theravada we would usually say that we train in the four Brahma Viharas as a support, as a way that we, as Buddhists say, do good, avoid harm, purify the mind, 
This is the very powerful tools that we use in the process of purifying the mind. So we use loving kindness to weaken aversion and also to generate merit and to the Buddha says in one sutta, the eleven benefits of cultivating loving kindness is that those who have loving kindness, their minds concentrate easily. So for all of us who want to experience peace in meditation, training in metta has that particular benefit that once we become somewhat adept, the mind will become peaceful quickly and easily. Similarly with compassion, uh, it's a beautiful way to respond to suffering rather than responding with aversion or fear or even with a uh, trauma when we see terrible suffering that if the heart can respond just with a quality of care and wishing that it wasn't like that then you have a noble and divine response and mudita empathic joy appreciative joy sympathetic joy is going against the tendency towards being competitive or jealous so these these powerful divine emotions help us to purify the mind, they give us a wholesome mind state to hold on to and radiate while helping us to put down the unskillful ones. And equanimity, really beautiful and profound quality that's not quite understood, it's not indifference, it's not ignoring something, it's actually based in wisdom, it's, a, it's serenity, equipoise, coming from understanding the nature of things. So there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of samadhi in the experience of equanimity, serenity. Ajahn Sumedho uses the word serenity, a very beautiful word. Uh, we would all like to be serene. So we train in the Brahma Viharas to keep our minds wholesome while we train in these three types of wisdom. Listening to Dhamma, studying Dhamma and contemplating Dhamma and then meditating and developing our insight. So I just thought I'd share a little bit of what His Holiness said and try to draw some parallels and now hopefully you're in the mood to meditate. Aware of one in-breath, nose, chest, abdomen, arising, staying for some time, ceasing. Aware of the out-breath, arising, staying, ceasing. And just knowing the breath in constant flux, constantly changing. Its nature is empty, there's no solid breath. And allowing ourselves to become comfortable with that. It's good news, it means we don't have to grasp at anything. That which knows emptiness is mindful awareness, and mindful awareness is something that once we've generated it, we can relax into it. Just relaxing into the awareness that knows everything as not solid, not self, not mine. And putting those thoughts and conceptions and constructs aside for a period of time and resting. Resting with the awareness of the breath, breathing in, put, Breathing out, do. Placing the mind gently. Experiencing the breath. Aware. Resting, but not holding on to anything. Putting everything down. Breathing in, placing the awareness. Nose, chest, abdomen. Breathing out, putting down the past, putting down the future, putting down others, putting down oneself, putting it all down, allowing it to be empty. One in breath, put, one out breath, do, just knowing the feelings as they change. Just thinking a little about the talk earlier and the example of His Holiness the Dalai Lama I thought I might add just a couple of things it's uh, in a way pointing to the potential of these Buddhist practices that we've met and uh, where they lead and it's very encouraging when we occasionally meet people who exhibit the results of their good practice it's very encouraging so 
along with those contemplations, contemplating the lack of an independently existing solid self in any being, how that aids in developing an impartial quality of loving kindness and uh, compassion. And someone who's a bodhisattva practitioner is determined about developing a lot of compassion for a lot of beings, just as our Buddha did for four countless periods and a hundred thousand eons before he was Lord Buddha. Uh, The other bodhisattvas, the serious ones, also practice in this way. They develop a sense of feeling a personal responsibility for the well-being of everybody. And that's what restrains them in a way from entering Nibbāna because the more you meditate and the more you become sensitive to suffering, the Buddha's instruction is to let go of its causes and when you let go of its causes you experience great peace and eventually you experience Nibbāna. And uh, and Dalai Lama also explained that Nibbāna is not a place, it's not a state, it's a realization. So it occurs in your mind and it's the fulfillment of uh, samadhi and insight and mindfulness, the Eightfold Path, all working together. The fulfillment is a realization of all of the delusion and confusion falling away and that which remains is the experience of Nibbāna. But uh, someone like His Holiness, you can see in His being an incredible humility and you can understand that on one level He has enormous loving-kindness and great compassion and great wisdom and great learning and these days he also has great worldly acclaim he's very famous he's probably if you could ask the people in the world currently who they would most like to meet I expect that His Holiness Dalai Lama probably comes first if you could take a poll but for him I really believe it's the case that as wonderful as those qualities are he really knows that they're empty in himself as well So why would you make anything out of them? His own realization, his own understanding is functioning internally as well as externally, so he knows he's empty. So he's not going to make anything out of emptiness. And then in terms of that realizing to some degree his ultimate nature, the peace and the goodness, ultimately there's a lot of goodness in human beings. And so that same wisdom and that same training enables him literally, along with his training to respond to every being with loving kindness and compassion, enables him to meet with some really, what I would find difficult to be with people, like when he got the Congressional Award from George Bush. It's a nice occasion getting the Congressional Award, but just this capacity that he has to look at everybody and I think instantly see their potential. So he doesn't see George Bush, he sees a potential Buddha who is even now ultimately good, temporarily obscured. And the thing of the result of this training, especially after hundreds of lifetimes, is uh, he doesn't even have to try. And that's why he says uh, he ends his day radiating loving kindness to the prisoners that torture Tibetans in Tibet is that he doesn't have to let go of grudge, he doesn't have to let go of anger, he genuinely feels concern for the karma that they make. And when he wishes that they be well, he hopes that they're able to let go of the delusions that allow them to behave in that way. Because what they're doing is they're creating their own future suffering. So uh, it's wonderful. I'm very lucky because I get to sit about four meters from him and I make him my meditation and just observe the way he responds to questions and the way he expresses his wisdom with a great deal of humility and uh, humor and uh, self-deprecation. But I share to some small degree what I can of what he shared with us yesterday. I hope it's helpful. Something else we'll do tonight, if people are interested. Many people in this room I remember from two years ago and many of you actually made a contribution at that time. I wasn't intending to stay very long, but I ended up staying nearly three months. And the consequence of that was uh, many of you made small donations, some of you made big donations. At the end of that three months, there was a sizable amount of 
fund towards establishing uh, the monastery I've been building in Thailand, so that was very helpful. And uh, one of the reasons that I came back to Melbourne is uh, I actually wanted to just uh, check in with some of the people that helped me. That contribution at that time was very helpful because one of the lessons I've learned as an abbot is that however much they tell you it will cost, double it. <laughs> because uh, the first work project that had been commenced when I came to Australia, because my mother was unwell, by the time I went back, I realized that uh, there wasn't enough money. <laughs> and fortunately, the contribution from the Buddhists of Melbourne helped a lot to get through that first year. And uh, so I am grateful for that. And I thought I'd like to show some photographs if people wanted to see what, uh, what we've been building there and what you also helped to build. But I don't want to be like a, like a mother forcing you to look at the pictures of the baby or the... So it is optional, <laughs> you don't have to look at the pictures, you can go home and get under the warm duvet if you like. But, but before that, was there any questions about the talk or the meditation? I'll give people the opportunity. I explained it perfectly well, nobody has any confusion, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Shall we look at some pictures? <laughs>